Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons on Patreon voted for the Battle of Prairie Grove to be animated this month. Thank you to all the patrons who support this channel. If you would like to support the channel and vote on future battles to be animated, visit the Patreon page and join for as little as $1. The link is in the description. Before I get started, I wanted to let you all know that the map that I am using for the animation is one that was drawn by Union Soldier after the battle. So the scale is off, but I have done the best I could to do the battle justice. You may notice that I have not included some of the units that were in the battle, and that is because we know they were there, but their exact role may be unknown, or their placement may not exactly be known. As I dive deeper into the battle, I will repost the battle with the other units added. Thank you all so much. From Union incursions into northern Arkansas from Missouri in the middle of 1862, the Confederacy acted quickly to assemble a makeshift army to repulse those invasions. Lieutenant General Theophilus Holmes took command of the Trans-Mississippi Department and appointed Major General Thomas C. Heinemann as commander of all Confederate military forces in the field for that department. Heinemann set about cobbling together the remains of various units to create the Trans-Mississippi Army. He made his headquarters at Fort Smith, Arkansas to oversee operations against Union forces in Missouri. Union General Samuel Curtis, who had led the invasions of Arkansas, took over command of the Department of the Missouri and selected Brigadier General John M. Schofield to lead the new Army of the Frontier. The new Army commander began probing the Confederate lines in the fall of 1862, driving out small pockets of resistance and attacking larger groups of Confederates when Heinemann was away which led to a victory near Maysville, Arkansas. However, Schofield became ill and returned to St. Louis, giving nominal command to Brigadier General James G. Blunt. The Union forces in southwest Missouri were horribly divided at that point. Blunt's division was near Cane Hill, Arkansas, 75 miles southwest of the other two divisions under Brigadier General Francis Heron near the old Wilson's Creek battlefield. In early December, Heinemann could not resist attacking the Army of the Frontier in detail since they were so divided. He planned to attack Blunt at Cane Hill, circling around the Union division with his cavalry, and either force him to surrender or rout him. Then he would deal with Heron. Blunt was no fool and quickly understood that his advanced position that Schofield had placed him in was vulnerable and that the Confederate Army was moving on his command. He ordered Heron on December 2nd to come to his aid. Heron got his two divisions on the road to Blunt on December 4th. As one historian put it, during the next three and a half days, the two Union divisions completed one of the most extraordinary marches of the war, an average of 35 miles per day on a primitive road atop the Ozark Plateau. Thousands of blue-clad soldiers fell by the wayside, but by nightfall on December 6th, the hardiest of Heron's men were approaching Fayetteville, only six miles from Cane Hill. Heinemann only found out about Heron's quick march on the night of December 6th, so he abandoned his plan to envelop Blunt and marched halfway between Cane Hill and Fayetteville in order to intercept the approaching Union divisions. He assembled his troops on a ridge overlooking a broad valley crowned by the Prairie Grove Church. When Heron approached the Confederate right, he perceived it to only be light resistance and only sent a token force to push back rebel skirmishers and artillery. The 20th Wisconsin and the 19th Iowa pushed south toward the Borden home and farm, with the 20th Wisconsin capturing a rebel artillery battery. The Confederates were in a unique situation. The woods on top of the ridge prevented them from shooting from their position, so in order to engage the enemy, they would have to come down the hill to fire on the blue troops. Troops from Brigadier General James F. Fagan's brigade marched down the hill and fired on the Badgers, who were cheering after capturing a battery of cannons. The surprise of such a large force against the single regiment sent the Midwesterners running. Just to the east, the 19th Iowa had advanced into the field of the Borden family. The 35th and 37th Arkansas caught the Iowans in the flank, and then Joseph Shelby's dismounted cavalry came up behind the regiment. Nearly surrounded, the Iowans had no choice but to retreat back to the Union lines. The first attack had been thwarted by Heinemann's troops, but Heron would try again with more regiments. To illustrate the destruction of the Blue Troops, the 20th Wisconsin had a 50% casualty rate, and the 19th Iowa had a 55% casualty rate. Fagan's men, who had pursued the 20th, got driven back to the top of the ridge by Federal artillery bombarding their lines. The first assault ended at about 2.30 p.m., and that's when the next assault began. The 37th Illinois and the 26th Indiana 
push south, but the Hoosiers ran into a solid force of dismounted cavalry armed with shotguns and pistols, inflicting a casualty rate of 45% on the blue-clad troops. The 37th Illinois fared much better. They were equipped with Colt revolving rifles, and those weapons took a heavy toll on the gray defenders, but with the 26th pushed back, the men from Illinois had to fall back to the Borden house. However, when Fagan's brigade advanced on them, the overwhelming numbers forced them to retreat like their comrades. Knowing that Blunt could attack him from the rear, Heinemann kept half his army waiting along the Fayetteville Road, but when he realized that Blunt was approaching his position from the northwest, he sent out Frost's division to link up with Shoup's division, forming the left flank. Blunt formed his brigades, Weir on the right and Cloud on the left. For an hour, Union artillery bombarded the Confederates along the ridge, then Union troops advanced against the Confederates, fighting through a dense forest, bullets splintering trees and bones. When the Federal Brigade commanders realized that they could not budge the rebels from their perch, they fell back, but the Southerners came storming after them. Out in the open, the Federal artillery played havoc on the Gray Lines and drove the Confederates back to their ridge. The day ended in a tactical victory for the Confederacy. They had held off Blunt's divisions, but it was a strategic victory for the Union. Heinemann had failed to secure northwest Arkansas and had been pushed deeper into the state. Each side licked its wounds, with the Union suffering a little over 1,200 casualties and the Confederacy taking between 13 and 1,400 casualties. After this engagement, the Federals would invade Arkansas and defeat the Army of Trans-Mississippi at Van Buren, burning five steamboats and capturing countless supplies and prisoners. Then, the Confederates moved further east in an effort to salvage what little of the Army was left. The Battle of Prairie Grove was a significant engagement, but it got overshadowed by the horrendous Union loss at Fredericksburg and the great Union victory at Stones River. Although the Trans-Mississippi theater of the war gets overshadowed in stories of the Civil War, I hope this video brings these stories to the forefront and inspires others to read about this less talked about location and moment of the conflict.